I'm me, your Enki Do, and this is Wiggly's Book Club, episode 016. Wiggly's Book Club is brought to you every other week for free, no money, as part of the GiantMediaBall.com network. Subscribe to GiantMediaBall.com today. Wiggly's Book Club is recorded live by Wiggly in Sloppy Joe's Bar, located in scenic downtown Easton, Pennsylvania. Without any further ado, let us now go live to Wiggly down in Sloppy Joe's Bar for the reading of the 1972 Penguin Books classic, The Epic of Gilgamesh, an English version with an introduction by N.K. Sanders. All right, there's going to be some hum in today's episode. Sorry about that, but I can't I can't stop that. I'm just getting Estella out because uh, previous episodes, I spent half the time freaking mixing a drink and then going behind sloppies and who knows. Estella areolas, that's what I'm going to call it. Usually never say that. I don't know if I should even try to read this one. Jeez, I got a sex to sexy book here. I got Gulliver's Travel and I got a Halloween costume book. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, did I read the Halloween costume one? I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe. I don't know. But I'm I'm gonna read this one. I'm gonna read this one. I got this for ten bucks. That's a kind of a rip off, I think. You probably you might get tons of these um, online for free. This is gonna be the Epic of Gilgamesh. Penguin Classics. I've tried to read this before, and I'm not even going to get really into the Epic of Gilgamesh. I'm probably going to only get through part of the foreword. Um, but I will read the, the back of the book, and this is a paperback. Yeah, Penguin, once again, Penguin Classics. I am Gilgamesh, who seized and killed the Bull of Heaven. I killed the Watchman of the Cedar Forest. I overthrew... Humbaba, who lived in the forest. Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, and his companion Enkidu are the greatest of the heroes to have survived from the ancient literature of Babylon, immortalized in the epic poem that dates back to the third millennium BCE. Together they, join, they journey to the cedar forest, slay the monster Humbaba and defeat the bull of heaven. I know all these names. I just, uh, you know, I might stumble over them a bit because I'm blind, dyslexic, and I can't see and I can't read. My glasses are dirty. When Enkidu dies, Gilgamesh grief, Gilgamesh's grief and fear of death are such that they lead him to undertake a quest for eternal life. A timeless tale of morality, tragedy, and pure adventure. The Epic of Gilgamesh is a landmark literary exploration of man's search for immortality. You see, you see what I'm saying here. It, it this uh, Gilgamesh is, and he, he, Gilgamesh meets and pitched him, and all you know the the Noah character, and this is all written down. Um, what did I say? Um, third. Millennium BCE, third millennium. So, four, uh, third millennium. I can't remember how it goes when you're going backwards. Is it 2000 or 4000? I can't remember um, right now. Well, let's see. If we're in the 20th century, 20th century, 2000. So, that, uh, well, now we're in the 21st because now we're in uh, over, over 2001. Um, but 20th century would be the 1900s. So if you go backwards, you're one behind. So two, 2000, 2000 BC, I guess. N.K. Sanders, uh, now nah, if I'm wrong, uh, who the fuck cares? 323. N.K. Sanders' lucid accessible translation is prefaced by a detailed introduction that examines the narrative and historical context of the work. The edition also includes a glossary of names and a map of the ancient Orient. And see, that's right, that is the ancient Orient, because uh, it's not the Far East, it's the Middle East-ish. The work of, well, no, it's actually the Middle East. The work of synthesis has been accomplished, 
And with a remarkable degree of fact, of tact and imagination, that's by the Times Literary, Literary Supplement, an English version with an introduction by N.K. Sandars, penguinclassics.com. Oh my gosh, there's some fine print. So I'm not going to read. I think it's uh, who supplied this one. Um, <clears throat> it's not a cylinder seal, but it's a, it's a carving. So I think it's just about the museum that provided that carving. Okay, the Epic of Gilgamesh N.K. Sanders studied soon after the war with Professor Gordon Ch Ch Child at the Institute of Archaeology, University of London, and took the diploma of the Institute. She continued to work at Oxford, taking a B.Lit. degree in the Bachelor's of Literature, I guess, a degree in the prehistory of Europe, and thereafter she worked on the prehistory of Aegean, Aegean receiving a studentship um, at St. Hugh's College, Oxford, a scholarship from Oxford University and a traveling prize from the University of Liverpool. She has traveled extensively in Europe and in the Near and Middle East and has taken part in excavations in the British Isles and overseas. She has, contribu she has contributed articles to various journals and is the author of Bronze Age Cultures in France, 1957, Prehistoric Art in Europe, Pelican History of Art, 1968, Poems of Heaven and Hell from Ancient Mesopotamia, Penguins, Penguin Classics, 1971, <coughs> pardon me, and the Sea Peoples, 1978. Uh, that's S-E-A, not S-E-E, -E, as if she sees people. I see just people. She has written and lectured extensively on the poet and painter David Jones and his locker, I guess, and on the origins of history of art. N.K. Sanders is a fellow of the British Academy and of the Society of Antiqua Antiquaries of London and a corresponding member of the German Archaeological Institute. A book of her poems... Grandmother's Steps and Other Poems was published in 2000 by Poets and Painters Press. Who cares? So she knows her shit. She's been around. Scholarships. Whatever. The Epic of Gilgamesh, an English version with an introduction by M.K. Sanders. Revised edition incorporating new material, which is good. Penguin Books. By the way, um, something I wanted to say about this. Oh, uh, yeah. So you can't find, like, the Epic of Gilgamesh with literal translations, uh, but I recommend finding an, an Epic of Gilgamesh with an English translation that tries to maintain the poetry and artistry in the original poems and songs and psalms. Because that's, uh, that's a lot more interesting. I... Uh, this this book is uh, half and half. It's sort of just in plain English, and I can't read all this shit. Published by Penguin Group. I just want to find a year on it. So, originally 1960, 1964, 1972. All rights reserved. So, this is 72. This I mean, this is... Uh, this is old. We've probably pieced together a lot more. This is, I know there's missing, ta you know, missing parts of the tablets. These, these are uh, clay tablets in cuneiform, which lasted much better than parchments, uh, you know, which all disintegrated and were from more modern times. These actually can date back to, to those um, ancient ages and closer to the source. The problem is, is that, you know, when different wars happened, people smashed all this shit because... Oh, you know, now we like Jesus, now we like Muhammad, now we like this and that and the other. And let's take all this shit and just fucking, you know, crash it and smash it and hit it with a hammer and bash it. And I'm not going to read the contents, which I usually do. Uh, first is a map of the Orient, of the ancient Orient, which shows Persia, Arabia, the Mediterranean Sea, um, Cappadocia, the Hit. Hittites, which is nice, Hittites. I don't know if that was a place or just a people. That's interesting. Uh, Bogazkoi, Bogazkoi, that's interesting. There's the Armenian mountains. 
So it's interesting, Caspian Sea, Black Sea, Persia. And I, so I don't see Constantinople on here, so this might be before Constantine. Uh, but then again, I don't see Istanbul. I see Elam, Babylon, Uruk, Ur. So the, you know, these are the first cities, um, Ur and Uruk. Oh, no, Kish. Kish is also here. Uh, Kish had one of the first female uh, leaders of Kish. Yeah, I don't know. Knossos is on uh, where Greece would be. And then Athens is there. Troy is in Ionia. Troy is in Ionia. Well, it might be something else. Introduction. History of the epic. This is, uh, let's see, 947. Thank you, 947. The epi uh, history of the epic. The epic of Gilgamesh, the renowned king of Uruk in Mesopotamia, comes from an age which has been wholly forgotten. Well, at least up until 1960 when she originally wrote this. <laughs> Until in the last century, archaeologists began uncovering the buried cities. So, it's true, you know, th this was, uh, even now, it would be considered within the past 100 years, although it would have been 115 years, but that's when we started finding more and more stuff in the Middle East, uh, uncovering and uncovering the, the cities that existed. Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls wasn't, was, uh, you know, fairly new in the context of thousands of years, which shed a lot of light around because it was supposed to be from around the time of when a, a, hist a historical Jesus was supposed to exist. And there's, of course, no mention of him. There's just another form of uh, Judaism going on, which uh, was the... Too drunk to recall right now. Let's get back into this. Uh, archaeologists began uncovering the buried cities of the Middle East. Until then, the entire history of the long period which separated Abraham from Noah was contained in two of the most forbiddingly genealogical chapters of the book of Genesis. Yeah, that's what it says. For Forbiddingly, forbidingly, uh, probably just meant shitty to read. <laughs> From these chapters, only two names survive in common parlance. Uh, those of the hunter, Nimrud, which I know is Nimrod, but here's Nimrud. Maybe Nimrud's a different person. And the Tower of Babel. But in a cycle of poems, which are collections round the character of Gilgamesh, we're carried back into the middle of that age. Indeed, uh, the uh, Babel Tower is is there. It's on coins, I think, from around that time, and Nimrod is uh, Nimrod is uh, there as well. These these poems have a right to. And remember, a lot of these people will have different names uh, for the same person. So, one one book you might read might have a name of a person being this. One might have this. Sud might be, you know. Um, uh, who the fuck was Sud? Yeah, forget it. I can't recall right now. She was uh, Enki's sister, I think. And I can't recall. Too many alcoholics. Don't drink alcoholics, kids. The poem have a ha, the poems have a right to place have a right to a place in the world's literature. Not only because the antidote home not only because they antedate. Uh, Homeric epic, you know, Homer, Homer, Homeric epic, by at least one and a half thousand years, but mainly because of the quality and character of the story that they tell. It is a mixture of pure adventure, of morality, of a, and of tragedy. Though the actions, though the action, um, though the action we are shown a very human, whew, are very are shown. <laughs> though the action. We are shown a very human concern. Through the action! That makes more sense. Through the action, we are shown a very human concern with mort mor uh, mortality, the search for knowledge and for an escape from the common lot of man. The gods who do not die can cannot be tragic. If Gilgamesh is not the first human hero, he is the first tragic hero of whom anything is known. He is at once the most sympathetic 
uh, to us and most typical of individual man in his search for life and understanding and of this search and the conclusion must and of this search the conclusion must be tragic it is perhaps surprising that anything so old as a story of the third millennium bc e should still have the piety should still have the power to move and still attract readers in the 20th century ad and yet it does the narrative is incomplete and may remain so nevertheless it is today the finest surviving epic poem from any period until the appearance appearance of homer's iliad and it is immeasurably older and see so that, that, that's very interesting what it said if you really listen to what that's saying it said it's saying homer's iliad is like one of the things that we could trace back most to its closest to its source nothing else can we do this Not, nothing else in, in um, literature uh, of course even including the old testament the new testament and all that um, can we trace back to as close the sources just don't exist you see so nothing can we trace back closer than the odyssey and the iliad or this one in this case just says the iliad and uh, but this epic of Gilgamesh, because it is on this stone, uh, 1523, because uh, we we uh, it survived. So we actually, have, we actually have pieces of this, and we can put them together properly because it's stone. So the pieces that fall out are like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. It's not like uh, trying to you know stitch together all this uh, paper that was written over and bleached out, and there's stuff underneath of it, and what you see what happened a lot of with the uh, with the older documents like the dead sea scrolls and everything like that if you don't know uh, people got more money if they found these parchments and then brought the pieces to people that were going to put these together that had concerned archaeologists and whatnot and and scholars so you know giving them a whole document might fetch them let's say you know, a thousand dollars. But if they brought them one piece at a time, each piece might get them five hundred dollars, which is I'm lowballing it just to explain this. So they sold them three or four pieces of it. Now they have uh, you know fifteen hundred to two two grand instead of just one grand for the whole thing. So that's why a lot of this shit is is destroyed. Sometimes it's also because they tried to burn it or they put it here or there, and it, you know the elements got to it. But most of it, you know, some things can survive because it's a dry, arid place. But um, that doesn't necessarily mean anything when you're going back thousands of years. We have good evidence that most of the Gilgamesh poems... Uh, whoops. Most of the Gilgamesh poems were already written down in the first centuries of the second millennium B.C. And that uh, they probably existed in much the same form many centuries earlier. So... Once again, like I mentioned, I didn't say this is this is the source. I said it's it's the closest to the source that you could probably get, and that they probably existed in much the same way, uh, same form, many centuries earlier. While the final um, recension, while the final recension, the most complete edition, comes from the seventh century library of Asher. uh, I know this one. Asher Bani, Banipal. I was just saying Asher Banipal. I know that's wrong, but I can't remember how it says. Antiquity, um, antiquary, and last great king of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, the Asher Banipal, that's I think I say. The Asher Banipal was a formidable general, the plunderer of Egypt and Susa. But he was also the collector of a notable literary, of a notable library, of contemporary historical records, and of much older hymns, poems, and scientific and religious texts. He tells us that he sent out his servants to search the archives of the ancient seats of uh, learning in Babylon, Uruk, and Nippur, and to copy and translate into the contemporary. Um, Akkadian Semitic those texts which were in the old Sumerian language of Mesopotamia amongst these texts written down according to the original and collated in the place of um, Esser 
Bani Paul. I can't now. I forgot. Asa, Asa Bani Paul, 1855. Uh, king of the world, king of Assyria, was a poem which we call the Epic of Gilgamesh. Not long after the completion of this task, a collection, a collation, a collation, the epic was virtually lost and the hero's name forgotten or disguised and garbles, garbled out of recognition. Until it was rediscovered in the last century, this discovery was due in the first place to the curiosity of two Englishmen, and thereafter to the labors of scholars in many different parts of the world who have pieced together, copied, and translated the clay tablets on which the poem is written. It is a work which continues and... Um, more gaps are being filled in each year. But the main body of the Assyrian epic has not been altered in essentials since the monumental publications of text. Transliteration and commentary by Campbell Thompson in 1928-1930. More recently, however, a new stage has been reached and fresh interest aroused by the work of Professor Samuel Kramer of Pennsylvania. Who Pennsylvania? That's nice. Who? That's where I am. Whose collection and translation of Sumerian texts have carried the history of the epic back into the third millennium BC. It is now possible to combine and compare a far larger and older body of writings than ever before. And that's another thing uh, that you, you try to do. You try to find as uh, close to the source text as you can, and then you compare it to translations, transiterations, etc. Um, of newer uh, copies of that same material to compare and contrast what lines up with the source and what doesn't so you can verify the document uh, and whatever else the fuck you want to do, fill in the, the blanks. The discovery of the tablets, 2103. The discovery of the tablets belongs to the heroic age of excavation in the mid 19th century when, although methods were not always so scrupulous, nor aims to, strict, uh, nor aims to strictly scientific as today, the difficulties and even dangers were greater and results had an impact which profoundly altered the intellectual perspective of that age. In 1819, young Englishman Austin Henry Layard set off with a friend on an overland journey to Cylon. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say Cylon. But in Mesopotamia, he was delayed by a reconnaissance. I'm going to say reconnaissance uh, because that's probably what it is. But it looks weird. Reconnaissance of Assyrian mounds. Assyrian mounds. The delay of the of weeks was lengthened into years, but in time, Ninveh and Nimrod were excavated. Uh, and it was from these excavations that Lay, Layard brought back the British to the British Museum a great part of the collection of Assyrian script, sculptures, along with thousands of broken tablets from the palace of Ninveh. When Layard began excavating at Invey, he hoped to find inscriptions, but the reality of buried library and a lost literature was more than he could have expected. In fact, the, ex, um, the extent and value of the discovery was not realized till later when the clay tablets with wedge-shaped characters were deciphered, cuneiform. Some inevitably were lost, but over 25,000 broken tablets, a huge number, 25,000 ta broken tablets, um, a, a huge number were brought back to the British Museum. The work of decipherment was begun by Henry Wa uh, Rawlinson at the residency of Baghdad, where he was stationed as political agent. Before going to Baghdad, Rawlinson, when uh, then an army officer and employee of the East India Company, had discovered what w uh, was to prove a principal key to the decipherment of cuneiform in the great inscription, the Record of Darius, on the rock of uh, Behistun, Behistun 
near <laughs> these one I'm not for these I'm not for Kermansha in Persia, which is written with cuneiform wedge-shaped characters in the old Persian uh, Elamite and Elamite, Elamite and Babylonian languages. The work begun by Rawlinson in Baghdad was continued in the British Museum when he returned to England in 1855. And soon after his return, he started publishing the cuneiform inscriptions of Western Asia. In 1866, he was joined as an assistant in the work of the on the tablets by George Smith. Meanwhile, uh, Rassam Lany uh, Layard's uh, clever. Let me just see. Let's see, twenty four thirty seven. See if I could get a little bit more historical background about the excavation and decipher the text. Um, the literary background. Yeah, let's get into literary back background part four here. The poems relating to Gilgamesh have survived from Sumerian literature. Remember, Sumeria, Sumerians, the first known people had um, multi um, um, they had uh, houses. <laughs> they didn't have skyscrapers, but uh, they had uh, very tall homes with many floors. They had real estate agents. They had homework. High school. They had schools, homework, uh, uh, spray paint, not spray paint, but um, what do you call graffiti and stuff like that. Five poems related to Gilgamesh have survived from Sumerian literature. Of these, two are used combined with later materials in the versions of the epic. They are Gilgamesh and the Land of the Living and fragments from the Death of Gilgamesh, which are now known to be part of a much larger text of at least 450 lines. This uses language much like that of a lament for Ur-Namu, an historical ruler of Ur, who lived around uh, 2100 BCE, which incidentally names Gilgamesh. Another, that's not necessarily meaning that Gilgamesh was a real person. Another poem, but I know there was a king that most likely called himself Gilgamesh. Another person, another poem concerning Gilgamesh and the Bull of Heaven lies behind the corresponding episode of the Ninevite uh, coalition describing the flouting and revenge of the goddess Istar. A large part of the Sumerian Gilgamesh Enkidu and the Netherworld was translated almost word for word and appended to the Assyrian epic, tablet uh, 12. With no attempt at integration, although it is incompatible with the events described earlier, tablet eight, uh, 7, and seems to... <laughs> Roman numerals aren't happening at this time, 2653. And seem to provide an alternative to the dream and death of Enkidu, which are placed at the center of the Assyrian poem Gilgamesh and Aga, like the death of Gilgamesh, is known only in Sumerian. It is, de uh, a, it is a detached and not very heroic tale of debate and mild warfare between the rival state of Kish and Uruk. Death of Gilgamesh and uh, Gilgamesh at Aga. I don't. I know these other ones, um, I, and I think I know the, the death of Gilgamesh, but uh, um, I don't remember it being about that. In temper, though typical of some Sumerian poetry, is too far removed from the rest of the Gilgamesh material for its inclusion in a Gilgamesh epic. Okay? It is not surprising if Asurbanipal's clerks and scholars rejected it, though of course it may have been unknown to them. The story of the deluge did not form any part of the Gilgamesh cycle in Sumerian literature, but was an independent poem within the role of Noah, a hero named uh, Zirsudra, which means he saw life. There is also, which Zirsudra is also um, uh, Adam him and, and other words are called of this first Noah. And Noah, I mean, uh, Noah is not uh, necessarily a, a, a Hebrew word. He saw life. There's also an old Babylonian deluge dating from the first half of the second millennium in which the hero is named Ataharis, Atahasis, which is also like that. In the poem, the flood is only the last among a number of disasters sent to destroy mankind. The first part is taken up with other matters, including the creation of mankind. A fragment of the Ugarit in Syria has 
already been mentioned. A late version of the Atrahasis poem was written down in the reign of uh, Ashurbanipal. Nepal. I don't know why I can say it one time, I can't say it the next. 2902. Uh, it is not possible to say at what time the flood was drawn into the Gilgamesh cycle, since evidence is lacking from the old Babylonian period. There has been much controversy on the question of the relationship between the Genesis flood and that of the Assyrian, Babylonian, and Sumerian writers. The opinion at one time widely held that the Genesis account was a late refinement on the story, on a story once current in all the cities of Babylonia, Babylonia is not now so general, while the view that it derives directly from a very old and independent history has many supporters. There is no need to enter this difficult controversy in order to follow the account of the flood, as it stands in the 11th tablet of the Gilgamesh epic. The decipherment of fresh texts may throw more light on the whole question. But at present, the Genesis account is probably best seen against the background of many very ancient flood stories, not necessarily relating to the same disaster and with different protagonists, both human and divine, not all the versions current in Mesopotamia and the Near East in the third um, millennium need have survived till today. The persistence, the persistence and independence of different stories is shown by the fact that the hero in the 3rd century BCE account, which is the last resort, derives from a Greek-speaking priest of Babylon, Bar Barosis, is given the name of Zisuthros of Sis Sisuthros. Zeathsuthros. I think that's pronounced Zeathsuthros. Um, which can only be the Sumerian Zeathsudra, although the name has dropped out of the known Semitic version. That's as far as I could get into this introduction. The introduction's quite uh, wonderful. Uh, you'll learn a lot about uh, Sumerian, um, Babylonian, you know, Mediterranean mythologies, histories, etc. I wish I could have gotten to the part with Enki and Ea, which is the same person, and Iridu and all that other stuff. I just, I didn't know where to start in this introduction, and I started at the beginning, which um, would have been more helpful if I could have started um, in the later parts of the introduction. It's very long. The introduction is, let's see, well, it, it's, um, well, with the acknowledgments, it goes 60 pages. So, okay, so it goes 58 pages. It was written in 1987, the introduction, so that's not too bad. Um, well, some additions were made, 1972 and 1987, some uh, additions were made, and then the acknowledgments, and then you get into the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh. The king of Uruk, prince beloved of An, who took his savage foe and rendered him a man. On every side, the crowns of the kings were heap. Hubaba sold my. Hubaba's. Hubaba's. Hmm. Hubaba's something my soul to keep. On every side, the crowns of the king. With Shamus's age, he turned the cobra clutch into a wife's embrace. The mere sight of him would make the kings capitulate. Shanagba Imaru, when the one desires can bear not of one to lose. Um, then it talks about the sycophant, which was uh, Ishtar, who sent the bull of heaven to destroy Gilgamesh and I don't remember the rest of the song I wrote, but that's from a song I wrote called Strange Man. I hope that you pick up a book on Gilgamesh, a book on Sumeria, a book on, uh, well, just pick up a book on Gilgamesh for Christ's sake. Back to me in the studio.
hope that you've enjoyed tonight's reading of the Epic of Gilgamesh, an English version with an introduction by N.K. Sanders. So on your own copy of the Epic of Gilgamesh, an English version with an introduction by N.K. Sanders, pick this up at Borders for $9.95. The management would also like to apologize tonight's super secret surprise celebrity guest, Al Pachinkno, could not be on the program. Your donations were just not enough. For Wiggly and the entire crew, here at Wiggly's Book Club, I am Wiggly. And remember, kids, when someone asks you, hey, how'd you get so smart? You tell them rip. Reading is fundamental.